It is good to be with you to study together again tonight. We had a great day this past Sunday together. This past Lord's Day was our first time to have an in-person Bible class in more than a year. We had the 9 a.m. early worship, then we had class, then we had the 11 a.m. late worship. And one highlight for me was hearing Brother Al lead the prayer for the class at the end of class on Sunday. It was obviously uh, great to be together, to study the Bible together, and to hear comments from everybody in the class. But it was just really good to hear Al's voice leading a prayer again. And then we also got to grill out together as a congregation. And when I say that we got to grill out, I actually mean that we watched Gary grill. <laughs> and then we ate the food that he grilled. I think our attendance was 62 on Sunday, give or take. And uh, that is just great, especially considering what we've been through together over the past year. And considering also we had a number of our members out of town on Sunday because of the holiday weekend. But of those 62 who came together on Sunday... 22 of them were guests of the congregation. So more than one third of those who came together on Sunday were guests. And that is absolutely great. If we could keep that ratio going forward, that would be awesome. So that's just some good news from Sunday, some things that I'm very thankful for. We plan on coming together again this coming Sunday at 9, 10, and 11. So on the hour, 9, 10, and 11, early and late worship start at 9 and 11 with a Bible class there in between where we can meet together in the middle at 10 a.m. Aaron plans on leading our thoughts through Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, John Long covered um, Hebrews chapter 9 this past Lord's Day. So Aaron will take this week and he'll lead us through Hebrews 10. So if you want to be prepared for class this week in a special way, take a few moments to read through Hebrews 10. Read the whole book of Hebrews again if you can. But uh, read especially Hebrews chapter 10 this week. And for our members, remember to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. It's based on the email address that you have in the church directory. Those addresses are pre-approved for the Sign Up Genius sign up. Uh, but guests are always welcome, and we would love to have you. If you're visiting with us, if you're passing through, if you're from the area, uh, just feel free to show up at any of those services on Sunday, 9, 10, and 11. 9 and 11 for worship, 10 o'clock in the middle for Bible class. Tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, explains the growth of the early church. It is written by Luke, who is a medical doctor. He's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, perhaps a government official of some kind. And this book covers a period of time from roughly 30 to 60 AD. And up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first nine chapters. We are ready for chapter 10 tonight. In the ABCs of Acts, we're using this as a memory tool, and in chapter 1, we summarized it with the word ascension, with Jesus ascending back into heaven. In Acts 2, we looked at the beginning of the church. In Acts 3, we saw a man carried by his friends, left at the temple gates, healed by Peter and John, and so the summary is carried and cured. In Acts 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples, and so they continue teaching and preaching as they were previously. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. As Peter and the other apostles are arrested, then they're let out of jail by the angel. They go right back to preaching as they were. Uh, we've summarized Acts 6 with the words, first deacons, but always with a question mark. We may remember seven men were appointed to coordinate the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows. They were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so these seven men seem to do the work that deacons do. There are some qualifications given. They are chosen by the congregation, appointed by the apostles. And so we see some parallels between what they did and what deacons do today, although that term is never used to describe them in, in a formal way. Uh, maybe kind of precursors to deacons. But first deacons with a question mark in our ABCs of Acts. In Acts 7, we had one of those seven men, Stephen, stoned to death for preaching, and so he is a great hero. Then in Acts 8, we had Philip preaching and baptizing the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch. You may remember when he first meets the eunuch, Philip asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies, well, how can I or how could I unless someone guides me? And so that's chapter 8, how can I? And then over the past two weeks, we've looked at Acts 9 which is primarily the conversion of Saul. So we now get to Saul in a bigger way. We had him introduced kind of at the end of chapter 7 there in the beginning of chapter 8. But we're back to Saul in chapter 9. And you may remember that Jesus confronts Saul in a vision there on the road to Damascus. He confronts him for persecuting the church. Saul wants to know who the Lord is. The Lord replies, I am Jesus. So that's our summary of this chapter. Uh, Saul continues on to Damascus where he prays and he fasts for three days. Ananias tells him what to do. 
Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. That comes from a parallel account over in Acts 22. Uh, Saul then obeys the gospel. He's baptized, that is. He starts preaching. He quickly gets run out of town, uh, run out of Damascus, escaping in a basket through a hole in the city wall. Uh, somewhere in here, as one of you reminded me this past Sunday, uh, something I had just forgotten about, forgotten to mention last week, but uh, somewhere in here, Saul spends three years in Arabia, where he learns more about the Lord directly from the Lord. So the Lord takes some time to bring Saul up to speed as an apostle, we might say. So he's not kind of a, a normal situation here, but he goes and he learns this directly from the Lord himself. Uh, this reference is from Galatians 1, verses 11 through 18, where he's trying to convince the people of Galatia that he is not a second-generation Christian, uh, but he is a real, live, genuine, capital A apostle, we might say. That's not the way he worded it. That's the way I think of it. And this is what he says in Galatians 1, verses 11 through 18. After condemning them for so quickly accepting a different gospel, this is what Paul says. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. And then he continues on from there. Well, we've looked at this passage as a reminder that Paul went to Arabia at some point shortly after his conversion, but before he starts traveling the world as a missionary. And that trip to Arabia seems to plug in here somewhere in Acts chapter 9. So I just want to bring us up to speed there, putting that, plugging that in where it goes in time sequence in the book of Acts. So this brings us back to Acts. Last week we ended with Peter over in Joppa, uh, having just raised Tabitha from the dead. So let's pick up tonight with Acts chapter 10, and the first paragraph is Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 8. Acts 10 verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. In verse 1, we're introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius, who lives in Caesarea. Caesarea is roughly 38 miles straight north of Joppa, also along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, just as Joppa is. It was built by Herod the Great as a port city and as something of an administrative center or capital of the area, at least for Rome's rule over this region. It was in the direction of Rome uh, from Jerusalem, and so dignitaries and military leaders from Rome would often get off the ship there in Caesarea before heading inland to Jerusalem. In this city, we have Cornelius, who is described here as being a Roman centurion. A centurion, as the name implies, was responsible for leading 100 Roman soldiers. And so he's probably a man with some leadership skills. He's worked his way up through the ranks. 
He has some experience. He's probably a little bit older than the average Roman soldier. I'm assuming they don't make you a centurion straight out of Roman boot camp or whatever. Uh, we have six centurions referred to in the New Testament, as far as I can tell. In Matthew 8, in Mark 15, here in Acts 10, over in Acts 22, there's one in Acts 23, and there's also one mentioned a couple times in Acts 27. And these men are not criticized in Scripture, really. They're not, they're not cut on, they're not put down. But generally speaking, they are described as being responsible citizens, even having faith on a number of occasions. You may remember it was a centurion who said after the uh, Lord's death on the cross, truly this man was the Son of God or something to that effect. Uh, Cornelius was a fairly common name in the first century. Apparently a guy named Cornelius freed 10,000 slaves back in 82 B.C., and many of those freed slaves apparently took on his name as their own. If we can imagine that, um, that kind of explains the widespread nature of the uh, name Cornelius. So there were a bunch of Corneliuses running around in the first century. In verse 2, we find that this man is a devout man and one who feared God with his household. He also gave many alms to the Jewish people, so he gave money, he gave donations to the poor, and so on. And he prayed to God continually. Um, a lot of us want to think that we pray a lot, but uh, I don't know uh, of how many of us it could be said that we pray to God continually. I mean, that's a pretty impressive thing to say about somebody. And so Cornelius is a good person. We might describe him as a good person. He at least wouldn't be seen by most people as being a sinner. He wouldn't be seen by most people as being lost or in need of salvation. He fears God. He gives he prays on a continual basis. And so just from an outward appearance, Cornelius is probably fine just the way he is. At least that's the way many people would assume the case to be. And yet that is not what we will find going forward in this chapter. And I hope we learn from this that being good is not really good enough, right? I hope you understand what I'm saying there. We're saved not by giving and prayer but by the grace of God through our obedience to the good news, accepting the gospel on God's terms, not ours. This man, in fact, fears God. And this is great. This is a great first step, right? We need to fear God, but our fear needs to motivate us to follow through with obedience to the gospel. In verse 3, Cornelius sees an angel, and the angel calls him by name, which would be pretty impressive. Cornelius pays attention to this, and he asks, what is it, Lord? We ran into this over in chapter 9, but the word Lord here does not necessarily imply deity, but it's the idea of somebody in a position of authority over us. Today, we might use the word sir, and certainly Cornelius in the military is very familiar with this concept, addressing people in this way, and he seems to be admitting here that he is outranked by this angel. Angels can be absolutely terrifying creatures in the Bible. I know today a lot of people picture angels as these uh, kind of chubby little babies with wings on their shoulders or whatever, but uh, that is not really how angels are described in Scripture. They are terrifying beings, or at least they have that potential. A number of times in the Bible we have angels appearing to people and the people bow down in worship. They are almost scared to death. They are in terror when they see an angel and usually the angel will then tell that person to get up and the angel will not accept that worship. Well, now that the angel has Cornelius's attention, he lets Cornelius know that God has heard his prayers. Sometimes people will wonder whether God hears the prayers of those who are not yet saved. And this argument or this, I guess, wondering that people have about this goes back to a statement made by the man healed from blindness in John chapter 9. As you might remember, the man is being interrogated by the religious leaders. Uh, they don't believe what has happened. Maybe they believe what has happened, but they're having a hard time attributing that to Jesus. And in this back and forth, the formerly blind man says, we know that God does not hear sinners. And his point is, God is obviously listening to Jesus, giving him this ability to heal, Therefore, Jesus must not be a sinner. Well, some people have taken that statement as gospel, not realizing where it comes from. It is inspired in that it is accurately reflecting what the man says, uh, but the statement itself comes from an uninspired man. In other words, the man is not necessarily speaking for God here. 
But a lot of times people will look through a concordance, they will find this verse, and they say this, you know, look, we know that God does not hear sinners. Therefore, if you're not a Christian, God is not listening. That's a conclusion that they jump to. So does God hear the prayers of sinners? That's the question. And my answer to that through the years has been God can listen to anybody he wants to listen to. Generally, though, those who call out to God in prayer are those who already fear God in the first place. Otherwise, they wouldn't be calling out to God. As Christians, though, we do have a special relationship with God. We are his children. And so, as I see it, just as I would generally listen to my own children before I'd listen to some random guy on the street, if I had to choose between the two, I would listen to my own kids. And so, in a same way, in a similar way, we as God's people, we have a special relationship with God as our Father that other people don't have. And this is why we pray for other people. Um, as Christians, we have the ability to intercede, to pray on their behalf. And so if my non-Christian neighbor gets sick, I can pray for her. Uh, she can pray to God herself, and God will handle that however he wants to handle that. But I know that God is my Father, and I know without a doubt that I can go to God, my Father, on her behalf. And I know that God will hear my prayer. I hope that makes sense. So we're not saying he won't listen to somebody who's not yet obedient to the gospel. Um, but we're saying that God pays special attention to us as his children. But I just wanted to mention this here because we have Cornelius not yet in a saved relationship with God, going to God in prayer, and the angel clearly says that God has heard his prayers. I would also ask, though, for what does Cornelius seem to be praying? Is he praying for a new chariot? Is he praying for a promotion at work? Is he praying for his safety on the battlefield? Is he praying to vanquish his enemies or whatever? What's he praying for? Well, he prays and God sends an angel who will then connect him with Peter. So we kind of have to look at the answer to the prayer to kind of figure backwards to see what he was perhaps praying for. And so... I might assume then that Cornelius is probably asking God what he needs to do. Lord, what do I do? Is my assumption as to what he's probably praying. Like Saul who prayed to God for three days and God answered that prayer by sending a disciple who told him what to do. Uh, so also here, Cornelius prays to God for something. And God, in response to hearing that prayer, specifically said here, he sends Peter in response. And this is the instruction from the angel. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon who is called Peter. And this is where we get journey to Joppa in the ABCs of Acts. Cornelius is to send these men to Joppa to go get Peter. Another note here, just notice how the angel does not directly tell Cornelius what to do to be saved. We've made a note of that several times already before. The angel doesn't command Cornelius to be baptized as Peter at the end of this chapter, we'll command or order Cornelius to be baptized. But as we learned a week or two ago, that's not an angel's job. That's not what angels do. It's our job to preach the gospel. It's, it's humanity. It's people. Uh, that's our job. In those days, the angel would sometimes arrange the meeting, uh, but the angel never told people directly what to do to be saved. And that's what happens here. The angel doesn't tell him what to do, but he tells him, how to go about arranging some kind of process where he can eventually hear the gospel. Once the angel leaves, Cornelius immediately sends these two servants and a soldier to go get Peter. The soldier is described as being devout, uh, coming from a word meaning good or pious, a good man, a good worshiper, maybe uh, some translations might say. It seems then that the soldier may be very similar to Cornelius. Uh, maybe they are perhaps on the same spiritual journey. There's something that these two men have in common. Maybe they've had some late night talks about spirituality, that kind of thing. Both of these men are perhaps looking for something more, spiritually speaking. Well, Cornelius explains everything. He tells them what's happened. And then he sends these three men to Joppa. So this is the journey to Joppa that summarizes the chapter that we're in here. Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 10 verses 9 through 16. Acts 10 verses 9 through 16. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop 
about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. In the first paragraph, we had Cornelius sending the men. Now we have what's going on. Meanwhile, up in Joppa, as the three men are making their way from Caesarea down to Joppa, Peter is also praying, just as Cornelius was praying. Have we really thought about the role of prayer in connecting people with the gospel? On one hand, we have Cornelius praying, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, probably asking God what he needs to do. And meanwhile, 38 miles down the shore to the south, the Apostle Peter is also praying. So we have one person searching, we have another preacher, an apostle praying himself, and God is about to make that connection. It's important to pray for the preaching of the gospel. If you would pray for me through the week, as well as when I stand up to preach every Lord's Day, I would really appreciate that. Some of you may remember Marge Holden. Uh, we thought of her as our adopted grandmother. I could not be near my grandparents in their later years. They were 600 miles south of here down in Nashville, Tennessee. And so we did get to go down there a time or two a year, but we were not able to help them in the way that we really wanted to help them. And so we kind of thought as, of Marge as our adopted grandmother. We would go and kind of help out a little bit over there. She lived on Mineral Point Road, about a mile straight west of the Target on Junction Road, kind of a salmon, kind of pink-colored house out there with four garage doors on the side in the uh, detached garage. But we would pick her up for worship. We would take her out to Cottage Cafe every Sunday morning on our way to church. And I remember her pulling me aside one time. And she kind of whispered in my ear, and she said, You know, Baxter, I pray for you by name every single day. And we really appreciate that. I don't know if you know how much that means to gospel preachers to pray for the preaching of the gospel. I get an email every Saturday afternoon from Jeff Jenkins, who preaches down in Texas. And this email is titled, Prayers for Preachers. And so he preaches for a large congregation down there. But this is an email that is only sent out to preachers of the gospel. And every Saturday afternoon, he sends out this prayer written out where he prays for gospel preachers and for their service the following day, praying on the last-minute preparations that are going on, praying for the delivery of those lessons all around the world, and so on. But it is so nice to know that somebody somewhere is praying for the preacher. But here we find that the preacher is also praying, right? So Peter goes up on the housetop to pray. The sixth hour is most likely noon, so six hours have passed since sunrise. That's the way they were keeping time in, in that culture. And so at noon then, Peter is on the roof and he is praying. I find it interesting that as Peter is praying, he gets hungry and he is desiring to eat. All right, think about this for a moment. We have an apostle praying. He is this righteous man, right? That's Peter. He is a, he's a righteous man. He's talking to God. But what's going on in his mind as he's praying? He is distracted by food, isn't he? Or at least he's distracted by the lack of food. He is definitely human, isn't he? And many of us have been there. We start to pray, but we get distracted by something. We might be hungry, maybe some other issue. As the people downstairs are starting to uh, fix lunch, I guess we might say, Peter falls into this trance. And in this trance, he sees something that looks like a giant sheet being lowered by four corners to the ground. And in the sheet, there were all kinds of animals. Remember, Peter is hungry. <laughs> Maybe he's uh, susceptible to being tempted by a giant load of seemingly tasty animals, is the way I would put that, especially those that were kind of under the ban under the law of Moses. Uh, some people have looked at this and they've said, well, uh, Peter was just kind of hallucinating here. He was so incredibly hungry that he looked out on the Sea of, Ga or sea of uh, Mediterranean Sea and he sees what's really a sail and he 
thinks that it's a sheet coming. No, none of that. Uh, this is a vision straight from God. In addition to the sight of these animals, Peter hears a voice also. Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. But this is where we have a problem. The animals in the sheet are apparently unclean. That is, they are not to be eaten according to the law of Moses. So at least in my mind, as I see it, this is a, a giant sheet full of bacon. This is a real temptation for Peter. To do this would be offensive to God. It would be something that would violate Peter's conscience. He'd never done this before in his entire life. He's never in his lifetime eaten anything unclean. Well, he's struggling with this, isn't he? This voice is telling him to eat. Peter's hungry. But this is something he cannot do. And so he pretty much argues with the Lord, doesn't he? By no means, Lord, or not so, Lord, as some translations have it. Imagine that, Peter arguing with the Lord. <laughs> that is classic Peter. A number of times he does that with Jesus, doesn't he? And here he's doing the same thing. So this voice, it comes not just once, not twice, but three times. And the message is what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. If you have a Bible with some cross-references, you might notice a little letter here with a little note in the margin with a reference to Mark chapter 7. Now remember, the events described here in Acts 10 take place at least a decade or more before Mark is ever written. So they don't have the book of Mark at this point. But this is the reference in Mark 7, 14 through 19. Speaking of Jesus, this is what Mark says. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated? Thus he declared all foods clean. I just want us to notice what Mark puts in there at the end of what I just read. It's, it's, in most of our translations, it's in parentheses. So, thus he declared all foods clean. So, there, there's this little account of what Jesus said. And then looking back on it by inspiration, Mark is able to say, it was at that moment that Jesus declared all foods to be clean. So, they didn't realize it at the time. But by speaking this little parable, Jesus was declaring all foods to be clean. It didn't click in their minds until several years later, perhaps starting here with Peter in Acts chapter 10. And remember, Peter had to hear this three times, didn't he? It wasn't just a one-time statement, oh, sure, Lord, okay, I'm good with that. No. Uh, for his whole life, Peter had been raised with the understanding that certain foods were not to be eaten. To eat those foods, it wasn't just something disgusting to eat. It was actually something that would cut off your relationship with God. But now he has this heavenly vision, when he's hungry, by the way, encouraging him to eat these previously unclean foods. And the vision is clearly from God. These animals are coming down from the sky. They didn't just walk up out of the desert or something. This is a, a message or a vision from God. And what we need to realize here is that the law of Moses is obviously not in effect as a binding law at this point. What was once illegal is now legal or allowed, we might say. Uh, years ago, some of you may remember, we had some people come to a meal at our church building. As I think we were providing a funeral meal for somebody in the family. And we had all the food downstairs and everything. And, uh, and we were ready because we knew what they believed on this. But I had an, an interesting conversation that day. Uh, a number of them were following the dietary rules from under the law of Moses. And we kind of got a clue of this beforehand. They warned us. And so we prepared a meal that would have been acceptable to them. We, we did, we kind of catered to them in a sense. We didn't serve up pork chops and all that kind of thing down there. We did not do that, obviously. Uh, not the loving thing to do, but they were following the dietary rules under the law of Moses. And again, we didn't argue, um, but I had a conversation with them. I wanted to know more, so I did a lot of listening and learning that day. And I could understand if somebody did that because maybe they thought it was healthier for some reason. I mean, obviously there was some reason why God made a lot of those laws the way they were back then. But these people actually seem to be following the law of Moses. 
as if it were actually law for them today. This messenger from heaven, though, says to Peter, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. These previously unclean foods are now acceptable in the eyes of God. And of course, the application of this, as we're going to see over the next week or so here, is that Cornelius is now clean. And not in terms of being saved any more than a pork chop is saved, but at least in terms of it being okay for Peter to go and interact with and to preach to this man. Well, let's continue on with Acts 10, verse 17 through the first part of verse 23. So Acts 10, 17 through 23a. Now, while Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked for directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited them in and gave them lodging. In verse 17, we find that as Peter is still on the roof trying to make sense of what he's just seen, as he is greatly perplexed by this, those three men sent by Cornelius show up at the front gate looking for Peter at the exact perfect moment. The timing is perfect, just as with Philip joining the eunuch on the road right as he was reading that passage about Jesus. And when we put this together, we find that these men were already well on their way by the time Peter goes up to the roof to pray. This is what we learned from the previous paragraph. Peter starts praying as the men were on their way and approaching the city. And so again, the Lord's timing's perfect. I'd like to think that this adds to Peter's confidence. So it's not like he just has this vision and then these men show up a couple months later. That's not what happens here. But all of this happens almost simultaneously. So I think that would kind of strengthen my faith in the fact that this is the will of God. In verse 19, as Peter's still thinking about this vision, the Holy Spirit lets him know that these three men were sent by God himself. And the Spirit's message is, get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings. Peter obeys the Lord and wants to know why the men have come, and they explain they're here to bring Peter back to Caesarea to preach to Cornelius. A new detail here is that Cornelius is well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews. So in addition to what we noticed earlier, we find here Cornelius also has a good reputation. And so we kind of add that to his, uh, like the, the good things we could say about him. And Peter then invites these men in for the night. We continue on with Acts 10, 23b through 29. Acts 10, 23, the second half of the verse through verse 29. And on the next day he got up and went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. On the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, for what reason you have sent for me? I missed this before, but when Peter leaves for Caesarea with the men, some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And that's interesting. So it's not just Peter and the two servants and the other guy, but it's the, it's the four uh, plus an unknown number of brethren from Joppa. So it's a pretty decent little group going up. And it's nice of them not to let Peter go alone with these unloaned messengers, I guess. They, they leave the next day, and then on the following day, they come to Caesarea. Uh, this, by the way, fits in with what we know from Google Maps. Um, the distance from Joppa to Caesarea is 38.5 miles. 
and that would take about 12 and a half hours on foot or just over six hours of walking over two days so that's very doable i mean you're you're kind of booking it um, but you'll get there and they got there in two days in the middle of verse 24 we find that cornelius is not only ready to listen but he has assembled his relatives and his close friends so he's concerned not just for himself but for everybody he knows and loves everybody needs to hear this this is how important it is when Peter shows up, Cornelius falls at Peter's feet and he worships. But notice how Peter makes him get up and he says, Stand up, I too am just a man. Years ago, when we visited the Vatican in Rome, there was a statue of Peter over to the side of that huge, huge building. And it was actually a statue of some Roman senator who had been reappropriated as a statue of Peter, and uh, there was a huge line of people waiting to either kiss or rub Peter's big toe. Well, you walk by, and when you look at the statue, it is all dark brown. I'm guessing some kind of tarnished bronze or something like that. It's, it's almost black. You know, the old statues made out of some kind of metal, they're all like bronze or, or black, all except for the toes which were as shiny as polished gold. It was like a mirror finish on the toes of this statue. The toes were literally shining. So many people would walk by and rub or kiss the toes on that statue. This, by the way, is the same Peter who reprimanded a Roman centurion for falling down in worship before him. I have a feeling I know something of what Peter might do if he could ever step into the Vatican to see that statue. I am imagining that that statue would not be left in one piece for very long, knowing Peter and his, his issues, we might say. Uh, Peter would be absolutely appalled, angry, in fact, I believe. We are not to worship other human beings. We can be respectful to those in positions of authority, but we are not to worship another human being, even Peter the Apostle says, stand up, for I too am just a man. As Peter walks in, he finds many people assembled, and Peter explains, this, this is not right for me, a Jew, to be associating with foreigners, but God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Note, this doesn't mean Cornelius is saved at this point, or that his sins have already been forgiven. That's not what Peter is saying here. But I think he's saying Cornelius is not cursed in some way. He is not off limits. But Peter now has the green light from God, we might say, to approach this man with the gospel, even though the gospel had not been previously preached to the Gentiles. In verse 29, I find it interesting how Peter points out that he came without even raising an objection. Is that right? Okay, kind of, in a way, yes. But then again, it did take seeing that sheet with the animals three times, didn't it? So he needed some convincing, but ultimately uh, he did not object and he ended up going. And now Peter asks again, um, as he asked of the messengers when they arrived back in Joppa, he wants to know for what reason you have sent me. And to me, I think back to those times when Jesus would ask a sick person, do you want to be made well? <laughs> Here's a guy there who can't walk or blind or or whatever. And Jesus had a way of asking that, didn't he? How can I help you today? Well, of course, this is what needs to happen. But there's a value to uh, verbalizing that, to putting that into words. And so Peter then is giving these people a chance to explain it on their own. Why have you called me? How can I help you? What, what am I doing here today? Well, let's conclude tonight with Acts 10 verses 30 through 33. Acts 10, 30 through 33. Cornelius said, Four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in shining garments, and he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is also called Peter, to come to you. He is staying in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Here, Cornelius repeats to Peter what we pretty much already know up to this point. It's another summary of a summary. Uh, we do learn here that the angel appeared in shining garments. I don't think we noted that before. Uh, but my favorite part of this passage is what Cornelius says at the very end. We are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. 
And I can tell you, I often think of this verse as I'm sitting on the front row waiting to preach. First of all, as Cornelius says, we are all here present before God, meaning that God is with us. But also, we have a group of people who have assembled here for the purpose of hearing a message from God. It is a serious responsibility. It is a great burden, in a sense, but in a good way to preach the gospel. If people have come together to hear the word of God, we need to be preaching the word of God, not our opinions, not a long string of funny stories one after another, certainly nothing that's false. But we need to be preaching the word of God to the best of our ability. When we come together, I don't want to waste your time with something trivial. That's not why we've come together. We are here to study, and so let's study. And so I personally just really love that last verse there and this summary that Cornelius gives. We're all here uh, to hear you preach the word of God. And this is a good place for us to pause tonight. Uh, next week, let's pick up with Acts 1034. As Peter preaches to Cornelius and his friends and the family who've come together, you may want to read ahead. And I know it's a challenge, but you may even want to be looking for some other way to summarize Acts 10 using the letter J. So for now, it's journey to Joppa. But if you can beat that, uh, I would invite you to blow us away next week with something completely uh, creative to summarize chapter 10 with a J. If you can do that, let me know. I'd be glad to, to change it if we can come up with something better than journey to Joppa. But journey to Joppa is going to be hard to beat. That's pretty much what happens here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And please plan on joining us between those two services for a Bible study from Hebrews chapter 10 at 10 a.m. And so if you're worried about not seeing the whole church because you only come to the early or the late and I can't see everybody, come to Bible class at 10. And if we all come to Bible class at 10, uh, that's how we overlap. That's how we get to see everybody. If you're a member of the congregation, this would be a great time right now to sign up while you have your device open. Uh, let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But let's uh, close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, a God who loves everyone and a God who does not discriminate. Tonight, we're thankful for honest hearts who are interested in learning more about you and your word. We pray that we would have the same attitude Cornelius had, an eagerness to hear from you. We pray that we would fear you just as he did. We pray that we would follow the example of Peter here as well, being willing to reach out and teach and share the good news of Jesus to anyone who's willing to hear it. Bless those who are studying your word through the mail. Thank you for those in the congregation who make this possible. We pray for those inmates and those uh, hundreds of others who are learning more and more every day. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.